Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Genesis. We are working through the Genesis, uh, the, the book of Genesis, week after week, and we are in Genesis 29 and 30 this week. We're going to read uh, chapter 29, verse 31, through chapter 30, verse 24. But before we read that together, let's pray together. Our Father, we just sang about the, the vision glorious, and we do long to see you with the eyes of faith. Of course, we long to see you ultimately face to face on the last day when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and we will dwell with you forever and ever. We pray that even now, as we hear your word, that that would be a foretaste of that day, that you would be present with us in the preaching of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit to glorify yourself and your son, Jesus. Draw us near to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 29, beginning with verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me. Therefore, his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, here is my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife. And Jacob went into her, and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant, Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, Good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again. She bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. 
Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. People long to be whole. I long to be whole. I feel keenly my own brokenness. And I use the word brokenness on purpose. I'm not sure what other word to use. Uh, Some Christians don't want to use that word uh, brokenness. Uh, Just use the, the sin and guilt, they say. Well, Why do you need to add a word like brokenness? And uh, the answer actually is simple, because my personal sin is not my only problem. We don't just sin. Sometimes we are sinned against. We don't just experience guilt. Sometimes we experience shame. And that shame may be because we have sinned, and it may be because we have been sinned against. We lie generally under God's curse on this world. Things do not work as they were intended. We experience sickness and death. What do you call that when something doesn't work as it was intended? It's broken. Our individual sin and guilt is just one part of the picture. It's a significant part. Don't mishear me. It's a, it's a major part, but it is a part. What do you call the whole thing? In Scripture, of course, God's law can be broken. God's covenant can be broken. Uh, there is uh, the breaking of judgment. And there is the broken spirit of repentance. But there is also a more general brokenness of the present age that Scripture talks about. Uh, In Exodus, Israel had a a broken spirit because of their slavery. In Scripture, plans and walls and hearts and strength can all be broken, right? Sin is a part of the picture, but these all focus more on sin's effects, the brokenness of our present age. Broken is, I think, a good word to describe the whole thing. We are broken. And we long to be made whole again, to no longer sin, yes, to no longer be sinned against, to no longer suffer, to no longer get sick and get old and get weary. Right? Tired is, is part of being creatures. Everybody gets tired. That's a part of life, a part of the rhythm of life, but weariness is a part of the brokenness of the fall. And so broken, I mean, yes, sin, but also it's guilt, it's pollution, it's curse, your sin and others' sins against you. We are broken people living among broken people in a broken world, and we long to be made whole again. We long for things to be put right, for things to be as they were intended from the beginning. A few weeks back, uh, someone told me that they thought Genesis 27 was one of the most tragic passages in Scripture, and it is. In that chapter, uh, everybody is scheming to get the blessing. Uh, Jacob and Esau are scheming to get it for themselves, Rebecca and Isaac for their respective uh, favored sons. There is scheming and lying and a complete breakdown of family ties. Husband and wife are at odds with one another. Son deceives father, taking advantage of his disability. It ends with one brother on the run for his life from the other brother. But this section this morning is at least as tragic. There is little sadder than people longing to be whole and looking for the wrong things in the wrong places by the wrong means. So we're going to be talking about our longing this morning. And there are three points where we look, why it will never work, and where wholeness is found. And we'll spend most of our time on the first point. Because that is what we see in our passage. We see Leah and Rachel looking for the wrong things in the wrong place by the wrong means. And of course, we tend to do the same. So first, we'll talk about where we look, where we look for wholeness. And I I want you to be asking yourself as as we talk, where are you looking for wholeness? Uh, How how would you define that even? What What are you looking to in order to feel like a complete person? How do you hope to get it? 
What are you doing to achieve wholeness or at least the, the feeling of it or the appearance of it? Where are you looking for wholeness? Now, you may remember in this story, if you've been here, Laban had done them wrong. Uh, Laban was Leah and Rachel's father and Jacob's uncle, and he tricked Jacob into marrying Leah when Jacob loved Rachel. It's a tragic story in itself. Uh, But now Jacob is married to both sisters, uh, something the Old Testament law forbids, by the way. Uh, Genesis 29.30 says, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. There is no way this can end well. And don't get me wrong, when I, what I think we see in Leah and Rachel in this section, you may be surprised to hear me say, is actually ordinary everyday faith. Why? Well, they get some things right, and they get some things terribly wrong. They believe God works, but they think he takes sides in their petty rivalries. And they often misinterpret his actions. They manipulate to get what they want, But at the same time, we see they are prayerfully dependent. They are crying out to God. Uh, And so there's a mixed bag. Uh, We we don't want to be too hard on them. Again, they they have been manipulated and used and are caught between two uh, rival master deceivers, their father Laban and their husband Jacob. So again, ordinary faith, right? That we're stuck in a broken world, half believing, half scheming to get our way. That, that feels familiar to me. Nevertheless, Leah and Rachel are looking for wholeness, but in the wrong place by the wrong means. First, notice what each sister wanted. Verse 31 says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Now, in the ancient world, we've seen this throughout Genesis, women prized having children. In the beginning, God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so women longed for the fruit of the womb. And in that day, of course, there was no police force. There was no retirement. There was no social security, no savings accounts. Your children were your everything. And when they grew up, they became your protectors and your providers and your caretakers in your old age. Uh, That's, of course, what made Sarah and Rebecca's barrenness so, so hard earlier in Genesis. Children are a gift from God. So when God sees Leah, that she is unloved by her husband, he opens her womb. He gives her the gift of a child. But you may have noticed that Leah was not happy with that. In fact, God gives her one, two, three sons, and she is not happy with that. She is not happy with sons. Why? Because what she really wants is the love of her husband, Jacob. Chapter 29, verse 32, at Reuben's birth, she says, now my husband will love me. It should break your heart. Verse 33, she conceived again and bore a son. She said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated. Do you hear the anguish in her voice? Verse 34, now, now this time, this time, my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. What does she want? She wants the love of her husband. It's not a bad desire, by the way. Husbands should love their wives. But it's clear, isn't it, that that this has become a controlling desire for Leah. Likely, uh, those few verses cover, uh, by the way, six years at least. Two years between each nine-month pregnancy, most likely. So over that six-year period, her overriding concern is to be loved by her husband. Again, in itself, a good desire. But for Leah, a good desire that has become an ultimate desire and so a controlling desire in her life. This is all she wants. She can't see the blessings that are right in front of her. Now, uh, Tim Keller, if I remember correctly, says that Leah finally learned that her satisfaction could be in God alone with her fourth son. She names him Judah, which sounds like the word for praise. She says, this time I will praise the Lord. Perhaps meaning, okay, I've been looking for the wrong thing here. I've been looking for the love of my husband I should be rejoicing in the love of my God. Maybe, uh, but like us, her growth is not in a straight line. Uh, Did you notice toward the end of our passage, uh, when Leah has her sixth son in verse 20, she says, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. 
Leah's one longing is not for children, which she has in abundance, six sons, one daughter, seven in all. Leah longs for the affection of Jacob. Uh, apart from that, it seems clear she, she's not content. She wants this one thing and she doesn't have it. Well, think about her sister, though. What does Rachel want? Verse 30 says, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. She was loved. She had the affection of her husband. She had what Leah longed for. Was she content? No. What did she want? She wanted children. She wanted what Leah had. She had what Leah longed for, and she wanted what Leah had. Uh, Chapter 30, verse 1, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. But she's barren. So what does she do? She goes the route of Sarah from earlier in Genesis. Uh, Now, it didn't work out well back in Genesis 16, but she nevertheless tries the same thing. Rachel gives her handmaid, Bilhah, to Jacob so that she might get children by her. She gets two sons from Bilhah, Dan and Naphtali, and she says this, uh, she sees this as God judging for her. Uh, Verse 8, instead of mighty wrestlings, you can see at least in the ESV footnote, it says, with the wrestlings of God. She sees herself in a wrestling match with God and her sister. It's actually interesting because this is going to become literal for Jacob in just a few chapters, you may remember. Um, But uh, Rachel, for now, sees her contest, quote contest, with her sister as a wrestling with God. And I'm not so sure God sees it that way at this point, at least uh, not in the same way Rachel does. Uh, You know, sometimes we read providence and we get it wrong. I think that's what's going on here. I don't think Rachel is reading providence the way God uh, would read providence. Uh, But what does Rachel want? She wants children, yes. But it's deeper than that, isn't it? Verse 23, when she finally has Joseph, her firstborn, she says, God has taken away my reproach. She felt disgraced. She felt like half a woman. She didn't, she didn't feel like she could show her face. She felt like a failure. Even when Joseph was born, she's still not content. She names him, he shall add, because rather than being content with the son she has been given, she immediately looks for God to give her another. Now, how do we know that these desires, Leah's desire for love and Rachel's desire for children, have gotten out of control? I mean, they, th- those are natural Desires. Why, why is it that we would say here they've, there's something wrong with them? Well, just look at the rivalry and the bitterness between these two sisters. Rachel envied Leah, chapter 30, verse 1. She saw this as a contest, verse 8. Leah, when Rachel asks for some of her mandrake fruit, is bitter. In chapter 30, verse 15, she says, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes as well? So Rachel is envious of Leah's children. Leah is bitter because Jacob loves Rachel. They have disordered desires, disordered because inordinate. They desire these things too much. Good things have become ultimate things and so controlling things in their lives. And so they're looking for the wrong things, at least to a wrong degree, and they are looking in the wrong place. What do they want? Leah wants Jacob's approbation, his love, his approval. Now, we were made to live for the love of another, but not for the love of another human being. We were not made for mortal love. Rachel, too, looks to Jacob. Again, chapter 30, verse 1, give me children or I shall die. We'll come back to this in just a second, but this is something Jacob cannot do. Rachel is looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place. And finally, both Leah and Rachel are looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place by the wrong means. How do they seek to get what they want? Through human effort and worldly schemes. Leah thinks, maybe if I can just bear enough children, then maybe my husband will love me. It's tragic. Rachel thinks, if I can bear enough children, maybe I won't feel like a failure in life. They both manipulate and scheme. They they each offer their handmaid as if their marriage wasn't complicated enough. Rachel seeks out the mandrake fruit, which in the ancient world was thought to help with conception, which, by the way, it clearly didn't work, because after verse 15, when they make the deal about the mandrake, what happens? Leah has three more children. So perhaps as many as eight more years pass before Rachel has Joseph. 
Now, perhaps the births of Jacob's children are not recorded in strict chronological order here. Some people think that maybe there's some overlap, so it, it's not one after another quite in that way. But either way, Moses, when he writes this story, separates the birth of Joseph from the mandrake fruit incident. And the immediate result of the mandrake fruit incident is not Rachel's child, but three more children for Leah. Rachel was looking to the wrong thing for help. Maybe this fruit, maybe, that, maybe that'll make it work. Where did these children come from? The text tells us. Not from Jacob's ability, no, he freely admits. He is not in control here. But back in chapter 29, verse 31, God saw Leah and opens her womb. Chapter 30, verse 17, God listens to Leah's prayer. Chapter 30, verse 22, God remembered Rachel and listens to her prayer. And yet these women spend half their time looking to man's power and old wives' tales to get what they want. Right? Wrong things, wrong place, wrong means. What about you? Where do you think wholeness is found? What are you looking for? Are you looking for relationships like Leah? Uh, do you think if someone will just love me, then my life will be whole, then the pieces will come together? Are you looking to accomplishment like Rachel? Do you think if I can just achieve more than the person next to me, then I'll be happy, then I won't feel so much shame, so much reproach? Do you feel the need to prove yourself, to feel whole? How do you hope to get those things? Through scheming, through manipulation? Uh, what lines are you willing to cross to feel whole? Are you willing to sin? Are you willing to sleep with your boyfriend in the hope that maybe you'll feel loved? Are you willing to lie and cheat at school and at work in the hope of getting ahead and feeling accomplished? Are you using people around you to try to boost your self-image and try to make yourself feel whole? Uh, have you noticed in almost the entire Jacob story, everybody is a means to an end for everybody else? There's, there's no love between these characters. They're using one another to get what they most want. Again, it's tragic, but where are you looking? What are you willing to do to get there? You know, since I became a Christian, I, I spent a lot of time trying to, to understand the scriptures for myself and be able to teach it to others, and I, I love what I do. I'm, I'm thankful that you guys let me speak into your life each week. It's kind of crazy for me to think about, but my temptation, at least one of my temptations, because I have many, is to try to find wholeness in this. If only I can preach a good sermon, if only I can really help people, if only, right, then I'll feel whole. Where are you looking for wholeness? To approval and accomplishment? To beating out your rival? To success in your work? Where do you spend your time and your energy and your money scrambling to feel complete? Well, that's where we look which brings us to why it will never work. There are two reasons here in our text. Uh, the first gets kind of meta, I think. It, it's not actually in the text, but it's the reason for the text. And think about this. I, I believe Moses wrote Genesis uh, for Israel after they came out of the promised land. Uh, maybe Joshua edited it after Moses died. Maybe some of the priests did the same later on. But the point is Moses is the author of this book. Why did Moses include this story in this book. On the one hand, you might say, because it records the founding of the 12 tribes of Israel, and that's true. But, you know, Moses, you didn't really need all these details. You could have tidied up the story a little bit. Why put Israel's origin in such bad light? I think it was on purpose. Listen to what Moses said in Deuteronomy. Brian read it earlier. They're on the edge of the promised land. This is what he wanted Israel to remember before they went in and took possession of their inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 9. We read, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust the Canaanites out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you, not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. 
and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land, three times he says it, to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. What did Moses want Israel to remember? That God did not save them because they were righteous. He wanted them to remember who they were. And I think he gave them this story because he wanted them to remember where they came from. This is, this is the first reason why trying to get wholeness from the love of others and worldly accomplishment just will not work because deep down, we know something is actually wrong with us. And deep down, we know there is something unlovable about us. And we may have others fooled, we think, but we know the truth about ourselves. Deep down, we know that we have failed, maybe not in accomplishments, but morally. We are sinners. Israel's identity, our identity, cannot be found in our righteousness because look at what we are like. We see ourselves in these stories, our controlling desire for love and accomplishment, our rivalry and our jealousy and our one-upmanship. And no matter how many people love us, we'll, we will always know we know ourselves better. No matter what we accomplish, we'll always think, but you know, somebody somewhere has accomplished more. Trying to find our identity, our wholeness in such things will never work. We know what we are really like. And I think that's the point. Do not say it is because of my righteousness that God brought me into the land. Now, there's another reason that this can never work. The first is that we are sinful, right? That sin will always haunt us and bring doubts deep down if we're seeking to trust in it. Deep down, we know something is actually wrong. But second, we are looking for people, for people to do what only God can do. Back to Genesis 30, verses 1 and 2. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? She says, Give me children, Jacob. She's looking for man to do what only God can do. And Jacob points that out. Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Now, don't get me wrong. Jacob's response is actually not what it should be. We, we know, think about Abraham and Isaac. We know that Abraham talked with God about Sarah's barrenness. In Genesis 25, 21, we're told that Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. When their wives were enduring the hardships of being barren, Abraham and Isaac responded in prayer. We have no indication that Jacob prayed here. Rather, when Rachel laid on him some actually unrealistic demands, he doesn't turn to God in prayer. He simply gets angry and says, it's not my fault. Don't blame me. And it's true, it wasn't his fault. But I know when I'm not praying about something and it goes wrong, I tend to get touchy, angry, defensive. Because I too think it should, I should have done better. And I'm not thinking, no, God is the one who's in control here. I haven't cast that burden on the Lord. When we look for people to do what only God can do, it's doomed to fail. When we look for this world to give us what only God can give, it is doomed to fail. This world cannot make you whole. Accomplishment cannot make you whole. The love and acceptance of people cannot make you whole. As long as you look to the world to do what only God can do, it is doomed to fail. And so that's where we look. That's why it will never work. And third, where wholeness is found. Throughout this whole story, Jacob is really little more than a pawn. He doesn't take any initiative to clear up the mess in his home. Rather, he's quick to say, he's not God, it's not his fault. But the scripture talks about a better husband, a different bridegroom. Scriptures say Christ is our bridegroom who comes to love us and make us fruitful. Isaiah says to Israel, who feels like a deserted wife, that her maker is her husband, that God would have compassion. 
He does that first, of course, by coming in the person of Jesus. Christ came and experienced our brokenness. He experienced a life of seeming fruitlessness. He experienced rejection and hatred. He experienced shame and disgrace. He died in our place for our sin. But then he rose in glory, receiving acceptance with the Father, being given the fullness of the Spirit that he might bear fruit in his church. And Jesus now pours out his Spirit on you and me that we might be fruitful and multiply. Now that may or may not mean children, but we can bear the fruit of the Spirit and we can multiply God's image in the world through the spread of the gospel, both to our children as we teach and train and disciple and to the world as we share the gospel with those around us. But the point is this, right? Wholeness is not found in Jacob. Wholeness is not found in acceptance by those around you. Wholeness is not found in your accomplishments in this life. Wholeness is found in Christ. The one who was broken for us, the one who was rejected that you might be accepted by the Father, the one who endured God's wrath that you might know the Father's love, the one who was cut off in the prime of his life, the one who was shamed and disgraced as he was stripped naked and beaten and mocked, the one who looked like his life was a waste as he died on the cross, but then who rose from the dead and now offers resurrection life to all who look to him in faith. Wholeness is found in him. If you would be whole, you need to really do three simple things. The first is remember who you are and where you came from. Here's the way Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were uh, of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We need to remember where we came from. We don't have anything in ourselves to boast in before God. We can't boast that we were mighty or rich or powerful. Our boast is in the Lord. Second, we need to stop. Repent of trying to find wholeness in the stuff of this age, even the good stuff of this age. Repent of pursuing applause and accomplishment. Admit that you've been looking in all the wrong places. Ask God to forgive you for pursuing life in the world rather than in the God who made the world. And then finally, look to Christ. See how he really is the glory that your heart has been after all along. Look at the particular desires of your heart. See how the deepest part of that desire is actually fulfilled in Jesus. And then rest in him and hope in him and find your fullness in him. All of the pieces of your life may not instantly click, but Jesus will begin to make your life whole. And let me say one last thing about all of this, because if you know anything of this wholeness, As you look around you, as you go about your life, notice the brokenness all around you. And consider who around me needs to hear about the wholeness that Jesus brings. How can I show that or speak of that to somebody today? The world desperately needs to hear that pursuing wholeness in human effort and human affection just won't work. They need to hear of Jesus, the bridegroom, who loves his bride and makes her fruitful. So go and share him with somebody this week. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that we would know wholeness in Jesus and that we would speak of that to others, that you would be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.